I think Kyle Testaman led one of the most colorful careers of any person I've ever known. The newspaper articles in great detail, like this paper that summarizes all that, that Kyle Testman did and was. Uh, I think for many of us, we had no idea how extensive his interests and activities were in this community and how many lives that he touched. Um, as a lawyer and as a businessman and a politician, he was eminently, uh, really well qualified to be a mayor twice. But in addition to that, Kyle worked tirelessly for community projects, whatever it may be. And as the others have said, there was a warmth and a kindness about Kyle Testman, very, very special. I think he brought to politics and to the community a type of creative solutions that were unusual. Unusual because they were often coupled with a sense of humor. And like Bob Booker said, he could express himself very, very well. I think for all of us, one of the most poignant examples of this creative solution solving with humor came in 1974 when the garbage collectors went on strike. What mayor in the country ever went out, picked up a garbage truck, and began picking up the garbage all over town? There was a sense of the ridiculous there, a sense of humor, but it was effective and it worked. The strike stopped. That was typical of Kyle Testman. I think that over and again, that trait came up in every relationship and every position that he held. As a young boy, as Tommy said, he was afflicted with peripheral polio. And one leg was definitely weakened. And there's a question of whether or not he'd be able to get back into athletics because of that paralysis. Later on, he went into rehab. And he had a trait of survivorship that very few people have. He felt he could overcome whatever happened. He would work at it. He was diligent. And over a period of time, that paralyzed leg did not heal completely, but it enabled him to get back into athletics in a way that no one thought possible. As time went on, he not only got better and better, but became one of the most superb athletes from this part of the country. His interests were primarily tennis and basketball, and he lettered in both, in both of them at UT. I think that his survival over and over again, and Kyle had a host of health problems, as you know, in later life. But he used to tell me that somehow, if he could just get back on the tennis court, somehow, that the quality of life would be good enough to keep trying to stay alive. So that it's a lesson for all of us. Something has to improve the quality of life if we have a serious problem of any kind before we can go on. And for Kyle, it was the activity we know as tennis. He was one of the most competitive tennis players I have ever seen in my life. And like Leonard said, when he hit the first serve, God help you, that serve was going off into the next court. And even if you got to it, you're in the wrong court. You had to come back. But he was very, very competitive. And he shared some of his secrets with us. We went on tennis trips together. And some of the secrets had to do with the foibles of opponents who might commit blatant errors and break the rules. One of which, what do you do? If you have an opponent that is a foot falter, for the non-tennis players here, that's when somebody 
steps across the line, baseline, and tries to serve. It's illegal. And the further over you go, <laughs> the worse it gets. Kyle, Kyle knew how to, how to handle that by simply going up to the net when he served, slam the ball down, and then say, 15 love, my point. Well, that didn't go over too well with a lot of his opponents, nor with a lot of the chair umpires. But Kyle would give them a choice. Their footfall may be 10, 12 inches. His was 35 feet. But he said, a footfall is a footfall is a footfall. Those are the rules. And he did it with great humor. You had to love him, the way he handled difficult situations. As time went on, the tennis became even more important for Kyle's survival. And in the last few years, when we went to dinner, we would reminisce about tennis trips all over the country. And he loved telling the stories of what happened here or there. And then, in the 1960s, Kyle helped found the Knoxville Racquet Club. And the Knoxville Racquet Club has developed into the premier club in the nation. And the first thing he did, remember the board, the original board, and he said, we need to encourage tournament tennis with the young people. And Kyle got out there on his own time, worked with the young people, helping them. And the most important one, of course, was his son, Ben. And Ben went on, as you know, to be a successful professional tennis player. But in addition to that, Kyle began to realize, as did Roe Camel, who was the father of the club, that as we tennis players get older, we can't keep up with the younger ones unless we cheat. But you're not supposed to cheat. So the answer was to have brackets at five-year intervals from the age 45 on up to 90. And suddenly, we tennis players look forward to getting older. Now we're in another age group, not going to push us as far as fast. And it opened up the world of senior competitive tennis. And that started over here at the Racquet Club. It spread across the nation, and then it spread worldwide. But the original concept came from Roe Camel and the Racquet Club in the 1960s. He was a pioneer in all of that. But his cr creative problem solving with good humor was the hallmark of everything that he did. So we're here today celebrating the life, the life of a very special person. And he made a difference in our community and in the lives of all of us.